Hi everybody, I'm Chris. And I'm Matt. We own and operate Drewfoot Guitars in Northwest Florida, where we build custom, handmade acoustic and electric guitars. We've traveled to the Stumac headquarters with the mission to shoot a video series all about aerosol spray finishing. I'm talking about pro-level aerosol spray finishing. Which is something you can totally do with no experience right at home. You gonna learn today. You gonna learn today. <laughs> <laughs> We're well on our way to getting an incredible finish on this Strat style guitar. In the last episode, we went over the critically important steps of properly preparing your guitar for finish, including sanding, with our glancing light on, it's amazing how much more detail I can see. Each little scratch mark is a valley where there's a shadow now. For filling, this is the absolute key to getting a glossy, perfectly smooth finish. And vinyl sealing. You get a nice rhythm going, doing 50% overlaps of each pass. Today we're focusing on the fun part, spraying your color coats and building your clear coats. So grab your respirators and let's get started. Welcome to episode number two. If you're just joining us, make sure you check out episode one first before you start tagging along here. Click on that, which is a link right here. For the rest of you, what we need to do is now apply the color. Let's talk about the color choices. As a reminder, we wanna stay with inside one brand's ecosystem when you're doing this. So if you're using one brand to do the vinyl coats, we wanna use that same brand to do the color coats and the clear. And it's important because we need to make sure that there's chemical compatibility between each one. In episode one, we used Color Tones Vinyl Sealer on this guitar. So we're gonna to continue to use Color Tones products throughout the entire process. Matt and I have spoken about it at length and looked at Color Tones entire lineup and chosen what is called Sonic blue because it sits right between their lightest colors and their darkest colors. Believe it or not, the darker colors show defects a lot easier. If you were to put black on this guitar, the tiniest little issues with finish, whether it's unevenness in the wood or dust in it, is gonna show up. I don't know if you've ever owned a dark car. Yep. The black cars, you yep. have to wash more than the white oh, cars. Yeah. Well, the same thing applies here. The easiest to apply would be a white finish because you can get away with all kinds of issues and you won't be able to see them. Well, Sonic Blue kind of sits right between those two and that's why we're gonna use it. All right, Matt, let's get this guitar ready to spray. As we know, we're spraying the body, that Sonic Blue. What I like to do when I'm doing a solid color on a guitar is to actually spray the face of the headstock as well. So we're just gonna do the face here and leave the back a nice maple color. And then when we're done with the color, we're actually gonna put a water slide decal with the Stumac logo on it here. And this is something that you guys can do at home and it's a cool opportunity for you to be able to customize the guitar in your own way. So you can experiment with it, get on your computer and come up with some fonts and make your own logo and stick it on here. But the first thing that we need to do is actually mask this off so that when we spray the blue on the face of the headstock that we don't end up with a bunch of overspray on the neck of the guitar. We don't need to be too careful. We remember how we applied the blue tape to the fretboard. We're gonna do the same thing here. Just slap it on there. And then use sandpaper. I recommend 220 grit to remove the tape. Just wanna sand through the tape. You don't wanna be taking a bunch of wood off beautiful clean line. Next, I like to mask off this rosewood. This is just a stylized thing. This has a very slight curve to it, so start here and then just work around to match that curve. Nice. Now this paint's gonna go through these sound holes and out the back side, so put some masking tape on there. You almost can't have too much masking tape. It's cheap insurance, as Matt always tells me at the shop. So, what we end up with is just the face of the headstock visible. And folks, now we're ready to spray. All right, as we head up onto the rooftop of Stumac to apply those color coats, I wanna take a moment to remind you of the tricks that we gave you on achieving a better finish with aerosol cans. And one of them is actually heating up the cans. Put the cans in a bowl or a sink of warm water, anywhere between 120 and 150 degrees for about 15 to 20 minutes before spraying it. This is gonna give you just much better flow. On top of that, invest a little bit of extra money into those upgraded nozzles for the spray cans. You're gonna get beautiful atomization and the control of whether you're spraying horizontally or vertically. With those two upgrades to a simple aerosol can, you're gonna have a much higher level of success. All right, we're back up here on the rooftop of Stumac and we have our awesome inflatable paint booth behind us. But I wanted to take just a moment to talk about how we're gonna go about applying the color to this guitar body. A big rookie mistake is that people just think that they can just spray it all on in one coat. It's super easy with these color coats to be too heavy handed and you're gonna end up with sags that you then have to repair and it's a mess. What we wanna do instead of doing that is apply 
two, three, and maybe even four very light coats and slowly build up that color to achieve the uniform finish that we're looking for. All right, just to recap some important tips on how to get proper spraying technique, we'll have Matt hold this up. We once again don't wanna be doing this pendulum move where we have the closest point at the center. We also wanna start and stop off of the guitar body and do 50% overlaps, remembering to try to keep a nice steady rhythm. That's exactly what you should be seeing on your guitar. We didn't try to get full coverage. We just nice and slowly are gonna build up that surface. All right, let's get into it. Whew. Okay, so we got that first coat of blue on the guitar. It looks a little blotchy, but that's exactly what we're looking for. You only go to apply the second coat here in about an hour, it'll be less blotchy. And by the time we get to the third coat, we should have full coverage on the guitar while also guaranteeing that we're not gonna have any runs with it. So now all we gotta do is wait. All right, we've come down from the roof after spraying colors, applying all three coats to this guitar. And man, look how it came out. Yeah. So nice. We don't have any sags or runs or defects in it. No blotchiness. We ended up with a really good uniform. And at this point, because we haven't applied clear to it, a very matte finish. And that's where we're starting to be rewarded for all the work that we did earlier. Your guitars at home should look very similar to this, but I guarantee you that if this is your first time, or if you do this for a long time, you're gonna to begin to start running into the occasional finish issue. So we're gonna take just a little bit of time and talk about those. Oh, hello, didn't see you there. Chris from Florida this time. Issues that might come up with your finish can be incredibly difficult to recover from, almost harder than learning how to apply a finish in the first place. In order to keep this video from being 40 hours long, what I'm gonna do is run down a list of five very common issues that might be happening with your finish, giving you the right terminology so that you know what to query on the internet to find solutions to fix those issues. Okay, the first thing that you need to identify, if you sprayed your finish and it's not smooth and it has all these little bumps and little dimples all over the whole thing. A little bit of it is okay, but if you have a lot of it, that's called orange peel. The name is very uh, apropos. The second one is when you've sprayed your finish on the guitar, whether it's the color coat or the clear coat, and you've got little spots where the finish is kind of repelling itself from that one little spot and it's not sticking to it. That's called fish eye or fish eyeing. It can be just in one spot, or in worst cases, you'll actually have them covering your entire instrument. The next one, within a few seconds or even a few minutes after you've sprayed it, suddenly the finish starts to have this hazy look to it. It looks like there's milk trapped underneath the finish. That's called blushing. It's because you've got moisture trapped inside of it. And that happens a lot to folks who are spraying in places that are really humid. The next one, it may be gone a little too heavy and now it's starting to drip. So if you're looking how to fix those, you're gonna wanna look up runs and sags. 
All right, and the last one, and this is a big one, if you've gone from one type of coat, either the color coat to the clear coats, or from the vinyl seal to the color coat, and then suddenly it starts to either blister up or start to crack like crazy, and clearly it's not supposed to crack or peel. Those are because you have either incompatibility issues or you're having some severe adhesion issues. Unfortunately, in that case, you might have to start sanding some finish off, I think. In fact, if you're a beginner and experiencing any of these issues, I honestly would recommend that you probably just sand off this finish and start over. I know that that's painful, but think of these extra hours as just an opportunity to gain more experience. The whole purpose with this video series is so that you have a successful first attempt when spraying your guitar. So. If you guys stick to the plan, stick to what we're telling you, do it step by step, I promise you that you shouldn't have any of these issues. So with that, we will now take you back to Ohio Chris, who I heard is doing a pretty good job. Okay, welcome back to the workbench. It's now time to prep our beautiful sonic blue guitar for clear coats. The first thing that we need to do is safely remove the masking tape that we applied. We are just gonna slowly remove it, making sure that we're not taking off any of the masking tape on the fretboard, because like I said, that's gonna stay there for the duration. So we're gonna pull this off. The task of removing masking tape can seem really simple, and you just wanna get in here and rip it off, but you should take your time and be a little bit more deliberate with it. As you get closer to the edges, you wanna make sure that the sticky part of the tape doesn't accidentally land on that fresh blue paint that you just put down as I bang it onto something. Yes, very nice. We're gonna pull this around. Inevitably, no matter how good of tape you're using, you're gonna get a little bit of bleed on there so we can actually get a more deliberate look to it by just taking a little bit of 400 grit, 320 grit. And with my hand, I'm just slowly going to do some light downstrokes, sanding lightly around the edges. Don't come onto the top of the guitar because you're going to get issues where you mess up the blue that we just laid down. Cleans it up real nice. Yeah, it looks super good. That is gonna do us really, really nice crisp lines. Now, do a careful inspection of the neck before we begin applying any more clear coats. If you have an issue with any of your masking that you put on here, and I do actually, I have some color that has actually bled onto the side of this neck, don't panic. We're gonna remove that now. Using a nice 400 grit or 600 grit, we can just lightly hit this spot where we have the overspray. Don't put too much pressure on it. And boom. Just like that, it's gone. Because you gotta remember that overspray is just very lightly sitting on the surface of that vinyl seal that we've put down. So we wanna remove the oversprayed color and not get into the vinyl seal at all. Water slide decals, that is the name of the game for this step. The exact process may vary on this depending on the instructions for your particular water slide decal paper, but they're all very similar to one another. Step one is to design and print your logo or decal. Water slide decal paper is available at local craft supply stores and on the internet. It comes with either white or transparent backgrounds. Whatever you choose, make sure that it is compatible with your printer type. If you're using an inkjet printer, get inkjet printer water slide decal paper. And if you have a laser jet printer, get one for that. Once your logo or decal is designed and ready to go, what I like to do is just print out a whole bunch. It prevents me from having to make more of them if I actually mess up the job. Plus, I don't waste any paper. After you print, the second step is to spray the paper with a light coat of gloss lacquer. And you're gonna use the same finish that we put on the guitar. It just helps seal in some of that ink and prevents it from bleeding onto the guitar once we try to apply it. Step three, cut it out with an X-Acto blade and my Optivisor. I'm gonna carefully cut out this Stumac logo all the way through the paper. I don't have to be perfect with it, I just wanna get it close. I don't wanna have a whole bunch of extra material on the outside because remember this the water slide decal is gonna stick up just ever so slightly from the surface of the wood. So I wanna get it as close as possible. You just take your time. I'd rather err on the side of caution away from the decal, not cutting straight up to the line because then you can cut into the color. Yes. Success. <laughs> <laughs> So what we have is our Stumac logo nice and cut out. We need to now apply it to the headstock. But before you do that, make sure you take your time and kind of move this around on the headstock and figure out where you want to put it. Because once this is released from its backing paper, we really got to get it in the right spot really quickly. You get one shot at it. If you mess up, you can remove it, but have a game plan in advance. So we've just got some distilled water. You can get away with just using regular water here if you'd like as well. And we're going to put it inside this plate. You can use a bowl. 
and it's only gonna take just a few seconds for it to release. Once it releases from the backing paper, it becomes really, really fragile, so you wanna handle it with care. I do recommend that you have a set of tweezers at hand and ready to go. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put this in the water. I'm gonna put my magnifiers on so that I can see just a little bit better, and it's going to curl up, that's what it always does, and you can just use your fingers to kind of make sure that it's fully submerged. I'm gonna hold this here. The other thing that I do recommend that you do is you take just a little bit of water and apply it to the area that you're going to be applying the water slide decal to. It seems to kind of help with the decal not sticking so hard. It gives me some time to be able to wiggle it around. So it just takes a few seconds for this to become ready. And you can just kind of push on it and then slide your finger and the moment it starts to release, you're gonna know. And there we go. For me, this one is ready. Now, this is called a water slide decal for a reason. The emphasis on the word slide. You're not gonna wanna pull this whole thing off and then try to apply it because it's just paper, not even paper thin. It's like human hair thin. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually remove that backing paper and slide it out from underneath it. And then very gently, we have an opportunity to get it into place. So I'm gonna very carefully move this over here I'm actually gonna set it exactly where I want it to go with the backing paper on it. And for me, it's gonna be right about here. And the trick to making this right is, usually with a pair of tweezers it really helps, is I'm actually going to slide the decal just out from underneath the paper, and then I'm gonna use my tweezers and grab the paper if I can. Here we go. And then with my finger, my right hand, I'm just gonna hold this exactly where I want it and slide the backing paper out from underneath it. Aha, right? So now we have an opportunity to very lightly put our fingers on there and slide it into location. If it's not exactly where you want it, you can actually move it around very lightly. You only get a couple of chances at that though before it starts to want to stick. So we are exactly where we want to be though. Let's see, I think I might have just the tiniest of little folds. There we go. Okay, so now I've got it where I want. What I'm going to do is just ever so lightly take a paper towel and we are just going to slightly pat it. And that's going to remove the water and it is moving just very so lightly on this, but it's just delicate. You gotta be delicate with this. At this point, we've removed some of the water and it's gonna start to want to stick. And now I can just be a little bit more aggressive with it if I want to. The important thing here is to make sure that you don't have any air bubbles or anything stuck underneath it. At first, it might stick up a little higher than you want, but as this dries, it's gonna really start to become almost like one with the headstock. And I got lucky on camera here that I got it right on the first try because a lot of the times what'll happen is it'll fold up underneath itself. If it does give you problems, don't worry about it. What you can do is you can just peel it right off and then grab one of your other decals that you've printed out and have a go at it again. It might take three, four, five times, but it's worth the effort. And this is just a really cool opportunity for you at home to personalize your guitar and make it special just for you. Drum roll, please. We're at that moment we've all been waiting for, which is clear coats, yeah. right? That's what we're here for, to do yeah. the clear coats. We are going to be applying about 14 coats of clear to this particular guitar. That's gonna require five aerosol cans of clear, whereas your color and your sealer coats are only gonna need one can. Before you freak out and go, 14 coats? Why do we need to do that? Turns out it's because it actually gets cold. Oh, <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> Is this thing on? <laughs> Is this thing on? All right, that's a wrap. Everybody go home now. <laughs> no, but we are going to apply 14 coats to this guitar. But I want to take a step back and better explain that because I don't like to think as my coats of lacquer finish as coats. Remember, nitrocellulose lacquer, like we talked about in episode one, when you spray it out of the can is mostly VOCs, volatile organic compounds, and the lacquer is suspended within it. And only a small portion of what we spray is actually gonna remain on the guitar after all those VOCs have evaporated. The other thing about nitrocellulose that's different than a lot of other finishing systems that are out there is that each coat actually melts into the coat that's above it. So yeah, you could do 50 coats if you wanted to, but what you're still gonna end up with is just one really thick coat. On top of that, throughout the process of applying each coat, we're gonna be doing some steps where we sand and remove some of those materials. So 14 coats, yes, it's gonna be one final thickness coat that's probably gonna be on average of about eight coats thick. Now, with nitrocellulose lacquer, because of that gas off phase of the VOCs, we only can do three coats per day. And that is just the most important thing that I wanna get across to you guys here. Three coats per day. Don't do four or five because you're in a hurry. Make sure you look at your calendar and know that, okay, I'm gonna be able to do this in X amount of time. So we're gonna do three coats a day. 
with a absolute minimum of an hour or two between each coat. And the reason we do that is because mm. we need the lacquer to gas off. We can't trap all those VOCs between each coat. And once again, this is one of those things that if you don't follow along properly, it's gonna sneak up and bite you. It's so important. And as we move forward, I'm gonna keep saying that because I think that the thing that really messes up people is not staying on a schedule. And we're also gonna start keeping notes so that we know how many coats we've put on there. Unlike the coats that we've put on before, we haven't, we've been able to see those, but now these ones are clear, so it's really hard to remember how many coats have I put on it. What we're gonna be using on this, just like every other step, is this color tone line of products. What's cool about the color tone line is that A, they're compatible with what we've put down, and like we mentioned, they are specifically formulated to be used on instruments, but they also sell these in a satin finish if that's more your style. I do wanna make a note about this. If you are gonna be doing a satin finish, you're still gonna follow the steps that we're doing here. And believe it or not, you are going to apply gloss coats with us until the very end. You don't actually put that satin coat on until the very last couple of steps. So if you're thinking, okay, this is gloss, it doesn't concern me, it does. So we're gonna use gloss, and for you, you're gonna to switch to satin for those last few coats. And on that, we wanna just cover one more time that proper spraying technique, and that is like we've said a whole bunch of times, so I'm not gonna get into a super lot of detail about it, but we're gonna remind you, we don't wanna be using those arcing passes as we go like this. We wanna start and stop off of the guitar and do nice, even coats with a 50% overlap. And then once again, heating these things up, thinking ahead. Okay, I'm gonna spray a coat in another hour, so I'm gonna go ahead and start heating up my can in some hot water, get it to around 130, 250 degrees, and then put that nice nozzle on there. And if you follow along with what we're doing, you're gonna be successful. But the main thing, believe it or not, that's gonna keep the people who are unsuccessful and successful here is patience and following the schedule. If you do that, even if you don't have good spraying technique, the patience is gonna pay off more. So do that and follow along with us and we're gonna get all this stuff and then head upstairs and start spraying our clear coats. As you see, I've got a nice glancing light going across the guitar. And as you spray, it's kind of tough to describe, but what you're looking for is a wet look as that clear goes onto the guitar. It doesn't need to look like it's been dipped in lacquer, just enough that you've got the surface uniformly wet. And you're gonna get what we call orange peel. Don't panic when you see that because it looks a little rough. Those VOCs are going to evaporate pretty quickly in these first few minutes of a phase that I call a flashing off and the finish is gonna relax and slowly become much more glassy-like and much more flat. So just be patient, continue spraying, don't change any of the technique that you're doing. And when you come back to spray that second coat in about an hour or two, it's gonna look a lot more flat. Day one, done. Six coats down. <laughs> Thank you.
three days, nine coats. Yeah. All right, we spent the last three days up on the roof of Stumac applying our clear coats to this guitar. We're up to nine at this point. This guitar is looking how your guitar should look at home if you've been patient and taking your time like we have. It's got the orange peel that we expect, a little bit of specks of dust kind of stuck inside of it. You're not gonna have a guitar at this point that looks finished. We still have to do the wet sanding process. For those of you that have never wet sanded before, you might wonder why are we gonna start introducing water into this equation? Well, the water is really important because it's going to keep it from being so scratchy. Well, you gotta remember that we don't want to add a bunch of scratches to this finish that we're then gonna have to cover up with more clear coats. We're just looking to level it out. Wet sanding washes away all the particles. As we rub that sandpaper on here, those particles are gonna get picked up by the water and washed away and keep it really clean. And we're gonna do it with a 400 grit if it's got a lot of issues that you need to work with, or a 600 grit if you'd rather be a little bit more cautious. For those of you that come from a woodworking background, you might be thinking, dude, 400 grit? Like that's already like super fine. But in the finishing realm, 400 grit might as well be 60 grit. It's so easy to burn through the clear coats that we already have on the guitar. You have to think of these clear coats as an insurance policy. We have color and then we have clear on top of it. So you have to be mindful. Okay, at this point, we've only got nine coats of insurance. So as you're sanding, please err on the side of caution. And if you think that you're getting close to the color, stop. A word of caution about using the water on your guitar. This one here is good to go, but depending on which guitar you're doing, you need to be aware of water intrusion and how that can cause damage. So look over your guitar body and your guitar neck and make sure that there's no spots that have bare wood that have no finish on them whatsoever. And you're gonna wanna mask those off or at least be very cautious of that spot and not get any water in that area because the last thing you want is water getting into there and swelling up the wood and it can get under the finish and ask me how I know. <laughs> you're gonna be hurting. <laughs> <laughs> and you also need to be using sandpaper that is compatible for wet sanding. And you can just tell by how it feels on the back. A lot of times this 3M gold sandpaper is always a nice safe bet. It has a little bit of a waxy feel, almost like it is waterproof. And then you'll have other situations where you have sandpaper like this that literally says it on the back. Waterproof abrasive paper. And for sure, those are obviously very safe. Um, what you don't want is sandpaper that just almost feels like construction paper on the backside. Those ones there are just gonna disintegrate when you get inside of here. So we're actually gonna take that sand sandpaper and put it in a bowl of water just to pre-soak. You can do warm water if you like. The temperature's not super important. And we're actually gonna add a little bit of soap to it. And that dish soap acts as a lubricant. The water alone, you can get away with it, but trust me, the last thing you want is it kind of to feel squeaky and starting and stopping. So adding just a little bit of soap to it is really gonna help make this job a lot easier. I'm also going to recommend that you have a spray bottle nearby and we have just some distilled water in here. And I'm just gonna add a little bit of soap and then have some paper towels close by. And the other thing before we get going is to make sure that your workbench is clear. For the rest of the process, for every step that we do when we're back here in the workshop, you wanna make sure your workbench is clear. When you're making sawdust, there's stuff everywhere, but when we, when we get to these points where we're doing finish, it's really easy to cause damage. A lot of times at home, we'll even put like towels down. We have these nice soft rubber pads here and that's gonna protect us. So. I'm gonna use a 600 grit on this guitar because it's already pretty smooth. If you're a little nervous about it, just start, start with a 600 grit. It's all about that insurance, right? 600 grit's not gonna cut through as quickly and it's just gonna give you a little bit more leeway. I think for the example of this video, we're mostly just gonna focus on doing the body. The neck is gonna be the same thing. All those lessons that we learned by wet sanding the body, we're gonna apply to the neck as well. But I actually usually just spray the guitar a little bit. We don't need to get absolutely nuts with it. You don't want this thing just dripping in water everywhere. And then I'm gonna take a sanding block with my 600 grit that's been pre-soaking. Uh, I'm actually gonna dip it because if I feel any sort of particulate on there, like I just set it down on the workbench, it picked up some dust, make sure you keep it rinsed off. You don't wanna be sm smearing you know, stuff that can scratch up the finish on there. And we are just going to take our time. I usually do a circular pattern here. We don't have grain to worry about now because now we're doing finish work. So there's not gonna be that issue of making sure you're going with the grain. I'm not applying too much pressure. The edges and the round sections on the guitar sand a lot faster than the flat sections. So, you have to be super, super careful when you get near the edge of the guitar. I'm always afraid of it. I want to be afraid of it. Respect the edge. Exactly, because <laughs> the moment you start to get comfortable and you just start mindlessly sanding is the moment you find yourself in trouble. 
And mind you, I'm using 600 grit and you see how quickly this is going. This is not taking a long time. What you're looking for out of the water that is on the guitar is that, and I'll have a better word for it, I always kind of call it slag. It's, it's just water with all the particulate from the clear coat sitting inside of it. And then your sandpaper, I'm gonna dip this in the water real quick. Your sandpaper at the point where this is, you can see that there's just a very slight amount of lacquer buildup on it. So you wanna be aware of that. If you're starting to get a whole bunch of lacquer stuck to it, switch it out, get yourself a fresh piece because you don't wanna be grinding uh, lacquer against lacquer because you can create damage that you then have to repair. So you wanna be aware of that. But yeah, that's the look that we're looking for. If it starts to get to the point where it's almost like plaster of Paris, like wet plaster of Paris, apply more water. You're not putting enough water on it. You wanna make sure that you're keeping this washed nice and clean. Um, kind of over in this area, it's starting to get a little bit thick. Um, so I do want to make sure I apply more water to it. You're kind of blind while there's still water on the guitar. You can't see how much work you still have left to do. So once you feel like you've kind of gotten the whole surface area, take a shop cloth and wipe it down, keeping it nice and clean. And you're gonna suddenly reveal whether or not you have more work to do based off of whether a spot is shiny or if it has a nice matte look to it. There's a spot over here where there's a little bit of orange peel still showing up and we need to do some more sanding. It's kind of tough to teach this part because it's an intuitive thing that'll, you'll start to learn, do I have enough clear coat on there that I can continue to sand? You have to kind of make that call on your own. So as I'm sanding the surface of a guitar, I'm kind of keeping a little bit of a mental notes about, okay, have I spent more time in one place than another? And I almost lay out a topographical map in my mind on the surface of the guitar. And once I have that mapped, I go back and work the sections that need it. Always erring on the side of caution though. And I do want to note, once again, I am using 600 grit here, not 400 grit. Due to the magic of television, you're not going to see exactly how long it took me to do this, but we've probably been only doing this for like 10 minutes at most, and we've burned through it pretty quickly. So. That's 600 grit. So if you're using 400 grit, it's gonna go even faster for you. So just a, a word of caution about how much time you should be taking. This is the look that you're looking for. Just a smooth surface with a nice matte finish. There's no low shiny spots. So with that, I'm gonna let Matt take over. Sweet. <laughs> I would focus on the flat area here, mm -hmm. not use the block to do this section here, just because it's got that compound radius, yep. Right. And you can probably feel it, right? Sometimes it's wanting to stick, mm -hmm. sometimes it's wanting to be more floaty. Yeah. And what you're shooting for is more that floaty feel. That's usually when the soap is getting in there. A little bit heavy on the water. You just want to have a misting. And so if you need to apply more, wipe it and then apply more. You can spend quite a bit more time in any one given spot. Okay. There's like a surface tension on the gloss. The moment you break through the gloss and you start getting into just more of a matte, the feel of it starts to change. It starts to push back against the, yeah. the sandpaper. You were like reading the finish. And that's what makes finish work so difficult at first. You don't have anything to judge it against. Good time to check it. It's never too early to check. I can tell already that you've got a long ways to go. Okay. <laughs> and, and you'll see me get down and I'm using the lights that are here in the shop to get that glancing light. And you can see that there are spots where there's shiny and there are spots that are a matte finish. And those shiny spots are the low spots. Do you see how we've got just, there's oh, low absolutely. spots all over yeah. the place, yep. Yeah. And he didn't spend too much time in any one given spot. So we actually have quite a bit more clear on here to give us that insurance we're looking for. So we're gonna continue to sand until we have a nice flat look on this. Right now I'm looking at, I think it's pretty much everywhere. I, I've got, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'd rather you need more work to do than you be like riding that lightning between uh, getting too close getting, to the color. Yeah, getting color, yeah. yeah. You'll notice that we're treating the guitar in three separate sections. The top, the back, and then the sides. And it's good to do that. Don't just think, okay, I gotta do the whole guitar. No, break it up into parts. And since you're not using a sanding block, you can safely do this ledge here. Okay. Matt and I were talking about how careful you need to be around those round spots, and he was good about not taking the hard block and doing that transition area. So he's gonna, now that he's working with his hand, we can safely do that.
no. I did the thing we're not supposed to do. <laughs> Matt had a little bit of an accident here, it looks like. Yep. Uh, and we always have a joke about it. It's actually a good thing if you think about it. <laughs> and in this case, I think it is because we're using 600 grit here. Matt had barely spent any time on that spot and he sanded through the color and we get an opportunity to show you guys what honestly might be a high likelihood that this occurs to you. Because we were on the edge in a kind of a double compound area, that spot was so much easier to sand through. Matt was doing it by hand. Uh, and what would you say, just a few seconds? I barely touched it. Yes. Yeah. So, you're probably going to panic when you do this and want to smash the guitar into the ground and quit. But please don't do that. A luthier is measured by how well he recovers from his mistakes, and you might as well start learning that now. Um, what I have learned over the years is that when this happens, be aware of it, but keep your focus, and go ahead and finish off the rest of the guitar, because we are actually going to be able to feather some new color onto it, and then build up some more clear coats on top of that. And we're going to show you how we do that and recover from this mistake so that you at home are armed with that information. But for now, we get to tell Matt how terrible of a job he did. <laughs> and we're also going to be able to take this lesson and use it as we work ourselves around the edges of the guitar because that happened there. Well, when we get over to the round areas of this, boy, let me tell you, it's going to happen super fast there too. It's not that I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed. Oh, that's the worst. <laughs> that's the worst. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna move on to the sides here. Same sort of deal. Apply a little bit of water here, and we're just going to work ourselves around. This doesn't take very long at all. It doesn't require a whole lot of work. I am erring on the side of caution. Mm -hmm. I don't want to sand through. Um, and we're gonna have more opportunities to be a little bit more aggressive the more coats we add. So I'm slowly now working myself around just the round over spot. You can see, all right, let me just take a spot real quick. I'm gonna find, so like right here, I haven't touched the round over spot, and we'll do this in real time for you guys with no cuts. This is how much time I'm gonna spend in this one little spot. So I'm gonna go start now. That's it. That was maybe five seconds. That's all it takes on those round over spots. It burns through super fast. Don't spend more time than that, and that's with 600 grit. This sandpaper that we have here is starting to get a little bit of buildup on it. Lacquer just has a tendency to want to stick to it. And once you kind of get to a point where you're getting permanent buildup on it, it's better to just switch out and have some new stuff. So Matt has brought us some fresh sandpaper. And I'm just gonna soak it, spray this down again, and keep working our way around. The cutaway area here can be a little bit difficult as well, just because it's just awkward. Um, this little round over area right here is gonna burn super fast. So I'm just gonna be really quick. And I'll just show you guys in real time, I think, real quick. This area is gonna be probably the most likely area to burn through to the color. So this has not been touched with sandpaper at all, this whole round area. So we'll start now. And that's it. That whole section there is perfect. Not a single piece of orange peel on there. I think that most people at home would probably would have spent three times that amount of time because you saw how much time we spent in one spot on the flat areas, but mm -hmm. that I think illustrates really well how quickly you can get yourself into trouble on the round areas. So yeah, you just keep on keeping on. This is looking super, super good. We've got a super wet workbench and that's all right. Okay, so before we start moving back up to the paint booth up on the roof, we're gonna dry the guitar off really, really good. Remember that water and lacquer are not compatible. So if you have access to compressed air, I highly recommend that you blow it out. Okay, so we've got this completely dried off. The workbench is nice and dry. We've made sure that we don't have any water all trapped down inside the pickup cavities and the tremolo cavity, and it looks really good. But just as much as water is not compatible with lacquer, um, neither is the oils and the soaps. So now we need to make sure we take some naphtha and we wipe this guitar down because naphtha is really good at removing any sort of residues and oils and things like that. So we just wipe it down. I use a lot of naphtha in my shop because it's just, you almost can't do it too much. But yeah, that's looking really good. Naphtha dries super fast. That's a nice little advantage of it. And uh, we'll move up to the top of Stumac again and kind of walk you a little bit through how we're gonna go about fixing that. 
burn through mark. All right, we're back here in the paint booth, but before we start putting any more clear on this guitar, we need to address the situation that we had here where Matt sanded through the color. So what we've done is we've gone back and gotten some more of our sonic blue and we've heated it up really good. The heating up is more important for this process than it ever has been because we really need this to be a really fine, fine, fine mist. So I'm gonna take this and I'm just gonna mist it on very nice and lightly. More so than ever, we don't wanna to try to cover this all in one pass. We're just gonna just slightly add color each time. I wanted to say all that before I put my respirator on so that you guys can get a sense of what exactly I'm doing. Once we've got that color on there and it looks good and we can't see it anymore, we're just gonna proceed as usual. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna let that sit for about five to 10 minutes just to tack up, and then we'll hit it again with a little bit more. All right, you can see that it's just ever so slightly, so I think we're gonna be able to get away with just one more. So about another 10, 15 minutes to get this to tack up, and then we're gonna mist it. All right, so I'm super happy with this. It looks super good. You can't even tell that it was there. So remember now we have color on top of our clear and that's fine. Just keep a mental note of an area where you maybe need to do a touch up. And we're gonna just start applying our clear coat as usual from this point. We may apply this a little bit more clear in this area with each pass just so that we can catch back up to where we were before. But as you can see, it wasn't the end of the world. We were able to recover from it and uh, nobody be any wiser. We'll just keep this between the two of us. We'll just keep it between us. Also, Matt's fired. <laughs> All right, I couldn't be happier with how that came out. Matt, your mess up is now fixed. <laughs> it's like it never even happened. It's like it never happened. It looks super good. We've only let it dry for a few hours, but it's good, it's dry to the touch. And I had an idea while we were up there. This particular guitar doesn't have any issues that require this, but we want to simulate doing a thing called drop filling because now is the time in the process of applying these coats where you'd want to do drop fills. And it's a situation where maybe you did your pour fill and you've started applying your final sealer and your color and a couple of clear coats and you're starting to see there's certain spots that after I've done this first level sand that are just, they're super low. They're like, you know, I don't think we're gonna be able to sand that low spot out kind of a low. They often happen in areas maybe where you have some wood joints, some binding, or in an area where you have uh, your fretboard meeting the neck of the guitar. Those are common places where you might need to do drop fills. After looking over this guitar, there are no spots that need it. So what we're gonna do, I think, is just simulate one of those for you. And uh, I think we're just gonna take the back end of this little file and just put a little dent in here. And then it'll be a great little spot where we can just show you how to do it. So I'm gonna just do that now, press this in here real quick. And we have ourselves a nice little dent. <laughs> so now we'll go about the process of figuring out how to do it. Reminding you that this is just a dent, so it's kind of slightly different looking than what we would have in a normal drop fill situation. But heck, maybe you drop something and put a little dent in here and you can do that. <laughs> so what you're gonna do is you're gonna take some of the same finish that you're using for your clear coat. And we're gonna shake her up real good, and I've shaken it up off camera because it's really loud and annoying. And uh, we're gonna spray a little bit into a cup. Um, we don't need any sort of respirators for this. We're just gonna apply just a little bit inside of here. Perfect. We just need a little bitty bit of it. That's all we need. What we're gonna then use is one of two products. Stumac sells these really good little drop fill sticks. And they're basically just little plastic toothpicks that have a section on them that uses the capillary effect and sucks up whatever liquid you're using it for to do drop fills. And then they also sell something called pipettes. And pipettes are useful if you're needing to do a whole bunch of drop fills. On an acoustic guitar like I build, you need to do a lot more drop filling than you do on electric. So I use these all the time. You can just soak up as much lacquer as you need and use them throughout the whole process. But for this one, we're gonna use these little drop fill sticks and uh, we'll show you how we're gonna go about fixing this. It's real simple. As the name implies, you're gonna drop and fill it. 
<laughs> but using these little uh, these little dreadful sticks, we're just going to dip this ever so slightly into the lacquer, just enough so that it's going to wick up the color or the clear coat onto it. And then all you got to do is just very lightly touch it to the middle of where that little dent is. And the moment that you touch it, it's going to wick right into it and pull right inside of there. And what it does is allows you to put lacquer in that space without having to spray it over the whole area. And what you're going to end up with is a spot where now you have a little bulging spot in the lacquer that's going to be higher than the rest of it. But we're going to let that sit. We don't want to touch that at all. After we've done this, we're going to keep moving forward with the process and applying more clear coats. Don't pay attention to that now. We're going to level that particular spot before we do our final buff out. We want that drop fill spot and any other ones that you maybe need to do on the guitar to cure at the same amount of time as the rest of it. So don't worry about it. And you can keep doing it as you spray. You don't have to do it on this particular step. If right before we finish, you see that there's issues, you can do it then as well. Just make sure you do all of your drop fills before you hang the guitar up to do its full drying time. Okay, so now that we have that on there, we actually don't have to wait much longer than just enough to get it to harden up just a little bit. So just even just 15, 20 minutes, enough that I can hang it up and it's not gonna create a sag. And we can get back up into the paint booth and we will have fully recovered from Matt's mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we've got three more coats applied to this guitar. You can see that it looks really, really nice. The really cool thing that I wanna make sure that we show you guys is how well Matt's mess up came out. <laughs> it's like it never even happened. It's like it never happened, right? So at this point, we are ready to move on to the next step, wet sanding, just like we did with the four or 600 grit after nine coats, but with 800 grit. So we're gonna slowly keep stepping up the fineness of the sandpaper. So same thing, but we're gonna need even less work this time because we've kind of worked out all of those major issues before. So this is like already looking super smooth. There's already no orange peel in it similar to one of those knockdown coats. A lot of finishers will actually stop at this point. But what I find is that by doing an 800 grit sanding that we have to do way less buffing, it's really just gonna be super flat. So this is that area where Matt messed up. I'm just gonna keep pointing it out. I'm never gonna let me live it down. Yeah. We're just gonna be super cautious, being very soft, knowing that there's less clear coat right there. It's looking really good. And looking once again in that spot where we had to do the repair, I can't see anything. And if I can't see it, that means that nobody's ever gonna notice it. <laughs> so what we're gonna do, give Matt an opportunity to redeem himself. And we're gonna do the other side here. Water, 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 but not too much. <laughs> yeah. I think it looks good. Cool. This is honestly Matt's first time doing the wet sanding. What were your thoughts on how this was different from the last time we did it? It felt a little bit easier. The main thing I learned was just be careful, be cautious, take your time, and be organized about it. This is taking like no time. So we are doing this with 800 grit. You could even get away with 1000 grit if you wanted to with this, but definitely do not go any coarser than 800. Just like we did last time, we're gonna make sure that we get this nice and dry and remove every bit of water that we can physically. If you wanna do it quickly, hit it with some compressed air. If you don't have that, just give it a little time to dry because once again, water is not compatible with lacquer. And then I'm gonna hit it with a little bit of naphtha again real quick. But it's already looking really nice. Looks very good. Yeah. All right, so we're gonna take this, go upstairs and do our last two coats on it. I'm super excited we're at the finish line on this thing. A quick side note here for those that are looking for that satin look, spray your last two coats in a satin finish.
right, 14 coats down, and we are done applying the clear coat to this guitar. It has been a long journey to get us at this point, but it's totally worth it. It's looking super good, super, super good. But before we can move forward, we have a very important step, and that's actually a pretty easy one, because all we have to do is wait. That's all we gotta do, is wait. And you have to do it, it's super important. Because as nitrocellulose lacquer, we have to let all those VOCs finish gassing off before we can buff it out. And the finish is gonna shrink back and shrink back and shrink back, get even harder, and you're gonna be able to get a much better shine on it. So how long do we need to wait? For an absolute bare minimum of 10 days. I recommend at least two weeks. And if you can afford to go up to a month, it starts to get a little bit of diminishing returns at that point. But what I like to also use as a rule of thumb is if you smell it and you smell any little bit of lacquer, then it's still gassing off and you could just give it a little bit more time. Like this one still has a long ways to go, obviously. If you feel the need to skip that drying time, you're gonna regret it because that finish hasn't shrunk back yet. And so you're gonna skip what I just said because you don't wanna take my advice buff out your guitar and feel really good about it, and then you're gonna end up with a situation like we saw with that purple guitar in episode one, where it has shrunk back so much that now you've got all these issues and you're just not gonna be happy with yourself and you're still gonna have to do another buff out, so why not just wait? Either on the, the, the stick that you have here or somewhere in your workshop, write down today's date. Whatever the day is now that you've applied this last coat, write that down so that you can use it as a reference for how long it's been drying. So that's what we're gonna do with this guitar. We're gonna find a nice safe place to hang it up. At my house, I have like a drying closet in one of the spare rooms in our house that I hang these things up in. Let it be a little bit out of sight, out of mind. Uh, I usually actually leave the doors open because I want a little bit of air circulation inside there. If you're on a bit of a time crunch, you can get away with maybe just putting a small fan inside that closet as well, just to keep the air circulation going. I do find that does help speed up the drying process a little bit. So in the next episode, which we have a link for right here, we're gonna see this thing through and we're gonna buff it out and we're gonna put the neck on and it's gonna look super good and it's gonna look like anything that you could buy in the store and you're just gonna be blown away at what we're able to achieve with aerosol sprays. So join us there and let's see this thing to the finish line.